for PACE was a Nell trial. Um, the, uh, what's her name? When, uh, Weirden. Weirden. And why isn't that mentioned? It's striking that the initial tri uh, PACE trial is cited 300 times. That's cited 30 times. And mostly by her and her colleagues, yeah. Because the people involved have been doing other work based on what they're doing the final trial. And but there's an ethical responsibility to summarize the literature that led to you feeling that they, there was enough ambiguity to do another trial. And they failed in that responsibility. And that's a, that's a, a bad publication practice that science recognized when it's selective citation. Creating the false authorities, a BMJ paper about that. When people see the relevance, they start, they start poking further. But these are clinician researchers. What they've done is they've gone on to develop clinical services. So they're not doing more research. It, but you have to cite relevant literature. They didn't play the science game the way they're supposed to. And there are people who don't give a shit about chronic fatigue who don't like the game being played badly. And they now have a dog in the fight. And I'm trying to appeal to the scientific community. I'm sorry, they don't know enough about your condition to care. They're going to learn about it gradually, but I'm more interested in taking down the bad science and getting them to take down the bad science. I'm sorry, I, I don't have, I'm 68 years old, I don't have the time to learn to, to protect six months of my time and learn about your condition. But I can, no, I can fire away at bad science, and you can take what I do and use it the way you want. And you don't answer to me, I will give you advice, but there isn't a, a movement that has the paranoid fantasies of the uh, science media committee, whatever. The science media center. Yeah, 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 we'll get to that. Oh, we'll, uh, we'll get to that. Uh, one time at a time. So I think the story of PACE should be rewritten. I don't understand the lack of patient participation in the design and interpretation. It's so against modern practices. It's so pre-2000. Um, and there are really important guidelines in the UK for having patients involved in clinical trials. They violate those guidelines. And they're going to say, well, we're from Oxford. We can get away with it. Or there are people going to say, hey, I don't know about PACE, I don't know about Oxford, but you broke the rules. And it's an object of study in my seminar that you broke the rules because we don't like people breaking the rules. So we're getting people relevant, pissed off about what's going on, who don't know and don't care about your condition. So keep their time in the 90s before this was the King's Fund. So they were in support of these policies in general, you know, the uh, biopsychosocial imbalance, um, as sort of place for actually developing understanding and developing costly disease uh, recognition. Yeah, treatment. yeah, yeah. I mean, the whole psychosomatic model is, it's, uh, they, in, in the United States, they have the American Psychosomatic Society, and they're very pained that they have a journal called Psychosomatic Medicine because they realize how tainted the idea that uh, it, it, it assumes the psychological uh, causation. You know, the roots of psychosomatic medicine is a um, German-American uh, psychiatrist who believed that um, psychosomatic conditions express, were metaphors for psychological conflicts. So the reason why women get more migraines is they don't have penises, and they have penis envy in their heads like a blood and gorge penis. It's a metaphor. I mean, this is the shit that you would find in these journals. And they're so embarrassed by it, they want to say, oh, so you look at the, they had a big fight, they decided they would change their title of the journal a little bit to indicate they were now doing more behavioral medicine. I mean, this is the kind of shit people got away with then. The fun thing in, in 2000, um, well, whenever it was initially promised, but 2001 onwards, was uh, built up, um, was the biggest fight. It was all the funding that ever came in, almost. And it was a political stitch up from a series of things where they had evidence for, so there was more evidence against, there was money put into producing evidence against, more reports. The reports against were always believed, they were always official, and the sure. reports for those against. And there was just this continuing background of 
interesting. The, and so the, the MRC could get away with funding this because there was so much momentum to start to take any consideration of, of the obvious lack of value. I mean, the, the design was completely criticised. There was no, never, never going to be any okay. useful. Let, let me use a, 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 a medical metaphor. It's an anaerobic process. Do you know what that means? It's things that can develop because there's no contact with oxygen. And there, the metaphor in this situation, a lot went on because it wasn't pointed out what was going on. Now that we start pointing it out, it gets hot if these processes continue in the way they were in the past. I think that there's a real game change going on. I, I think that I put these joke tweets up uh, that, and, that only until midnight tonight, I think, that can you uh, can they refer to patients a certain way? I have no idea who can legislate that, but it makes people well, nervous. It's actually, it's funny and it's funny, yeah. humor because what you're saying is true. There's a license in the UK media to treat people with any with utter, utter Okay, dish, but we can change that. Okay. And sometimes if I have to stop uh, and tell the journalist he's being an asshole and change. get public and get punished for that, I don't give a shit. I don't live in the UK. It will properly change when the science changes. And yeah, but we made that people has, uncomfortable. Has you know, Lyndon Johnson said some horribly racist things, but when the time came, he pushed through the um, civil rights. Um, and I, I think there are a lot of people, I mean, there are some who won't name names, and please don't name names. There are some uh, uh, chefs, master chefs in this whole thing, that dictate recipes how to do things. But a lot of people are just cooks and bakers following those recipes, and they don't have a real investment, they don't know how to do it otherwise. The thing you need to get is most of the journalists out there, um, their problem is that they're temporarily able-bodied, and they don't know it. They haven't thought about it. There was a, yeah, so a, a patient I had educated me on this 35 years ago, it stuck with me. He said, you know, yeah, I'm here to work on my anger, and I've got a penile pump that doesn't work, and I got my toe in a box because of all the complications of diabetes, and I've been told I'm angry. And you can't work with me because like everybody else, all the other professionals, you're temporarily able-bodied and you don't know it. I used to race sports cars, and um, now I um, race cars, and then I, I didn't realize that I had diabetes and what it would do to me. I had different thought about people who had uh, disabilities. And, I, and I, now that I'm 67 years old, I know I'm temporarily able-bodied. I won't be that way forever. But a lot of people, I'll bet there was a point in the lives of many sufferers of this condition who they do, didn't occur to them that they um, uh, would ever face this. They believed they were able-bodied. They had a wonderful life ahead. And they made judgments about people who were disabled. And I think. You need to have empathy for some of these journalists who don't know a lot. They don't even know about their own mortality. They haven't thought it through. And some of them will come around once they, they, the spell is, is, is broken. The main problem with journalism, as far as I can see, is that it's only the sensational that actually gets advertising. So when you actually have reasoning and you know, it's a balanced argument, then that loses advertising, so they're going to publish. Yeah, but the, the journalists, they have to have some claim to journalistic credibility and to ethics. It may be a loose claim. It may be an inconsistent claim. They, um, you can't call them out on this um, consistently without them changing their behavior. When I attacked the Guardian, they started trying to clean up their act. The problem is the Guardian, like a lot of uh, 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 media outlets, is deprofessionalized. They fired their, um, their, their paid staff. They're doing stuff on freelance and blogging right now. Some of it's excellent stuff, and some of it is really irresponsible. And they need to, need to uh, develop a new ethics code for people who are working in those conditions. The freelancers get paid to have sensational stories. They're not working for the patient community, nor are they working for the scientists. And they need to be called up on their ethics. Their job is to filter what the scientists say to them because the, the scientists may have an agenda. So, uh, I'm going to be addressing, I'm going to speak past the patients in a lot of my blogging 
because I guess we, I get to get the scientific community involved. I even get them pissed off about bad science, about bad pre uh, uh, publication practice in the institutions that develop. Take what I use, don't be offended if I'm addressing it, if I'm talking past. You know what I'm talking about and you can use it the way you want. Um, I'm not hired by you, I don't work for you, you don't work for me, there's no monolithic, you can't report me. Uh, you know, they, they say the, the, um, the, the uh, vexatious, I love that term. That's, you know, Every challenge, any you know I, now I understand why Britain had developed Orwell and, and Monty Python. There's such a pomposity to the language and doing things. You know, and I say, shit, as an American, are these guys serious? Okay, but we're getting there. Okay, Ostland, it's a term, they, it means German outsider. Ben Franklin was a guy who didn't get along with his family, didn't get along with people in Boston. And he came down to Philadelphia. He was aggressive, individualistic. The Philadelphia back then was a bunch of Quakers and some Episcopalians. And they, 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 they felt that um, the culture of Philadelphia couldn't respond to the challenge of that. They had gotten decimated, the Quakes had gotten decimated in the French Indian War because they were pacifists. And they tried to say, I'm sorry, we don't do this war thing, and get scalped because the French were buying the scalps uh, from the Indians. And so the idea is you need us lands, you need outsiders. And I think the reason it has to be done by outsiders is all we need to do is look at Ben Gott, uh, Goldacre. He's a problem. He really wants to cultivate favor of the British establishment. He wants desperately to be a full-time faculty member. He's not. He supports himself blogging, he turns blogs into books, seeing patients, part-time faculty. He's not one of the club and it makes him reluctant to criticize Simon and the pace crowd. And um, he says such inspiring things about sharing data, he won't say it about pace. But that's because he's, he, he's playing the game by their rules. I'm not. And then this, this offensive thing. I can't believe this as an American. You've all seen that. That's giving away your free speech. Look at that. You, does that mean if you sign a petition that's an orchestrated campaign about, against those? Um, that, this is such a load of crap. It doesn't mean that. It, it only means what it can mean. It can mean of, anything they want. I no, showed no, that to no, a lawyer. No. I showed that to a lawyer in the United States, uh -huh. and he said, "Whiskey Tango Fox Trot." They but signed this. That's the point. Uh -huh. Under law, it can only mean exactly what it's all about. Yeah, but right. it becomes it, it's a form of intimidation. Right. It, it makes people flip yeah. things twice. Yeah. Uh -huh. I get trolls on my blog all the time. And I get sock puppets. These are uh, the, the you know, people made up names. I use uh, software to locate those people. And they're not patients. They're professionals from the British Psychological Society. And then I send them an email saying, "I know who you are." And I'll say, "I don't know for sure it's you, but it's somebody within three houses of you." Here's a map of the meadows. Um, uh, compliments of the internet company. And, you know, I, I don't have a button like Simon does, or, you know, panic button, or I don't uh, x-ray my mail. What kind um, of button is Simon got? A panic button in his office. Well, you can keep track of me. Uh, uh, there's a website that uh, I'm giving everything away right now. You can go there and find out what I'm doing and where. And um, you get pissed off at what I say. And you can, you can say, tell me to tone down the language. Brits don't do it that way. But, you know, we have our own problems in the States. I mean, it's not that everything, it's, it's rosy there. But I, I think you need an outsider who um, isn't, it becomes part of your way of doing things. You don't even question it. I think that um, there are some people like Ben Golding who's trying to cultivate acceptance by the establishment. And there are other people who don't even think about it. They're just doing what they're supposed to do because everybody around them is doing that. And it, I don't think it's a conspiracy. I think you could start by saying the fault is in our society. Our society is Thank you. You say it's about politics. I also think it's about best interests. Yes. So they're the same thing sometimes. Mm -hmm. But if I want to keep my academic position, I've got to observe certain rules. Yes. 
if I want to sell my product, I've got to sell it. And selling does not necessarily mean science. So I think it, I, I understand that I understand how bad popular reporting might be. I don't think we blame journalists if the stuff that the scientists gives them. Well, let, let, let's talk about the enough. conflict of interest thing. Yeah. I'm a certified troublemaker, according to the, the, uh, the Cochrane collaboration. I understand the collaboration. Well, what happened? Well, what happened is it, it's it's an interesting story. I wanted to, I wrote a paper that one BMJ said it was one of the top papers of the year in 2008. It was in JAMA, and it was a paper about screening for depression uh, in cardiac patients. So I went back to JAMA and said, okay, uh, we're on a roll looking at BMJ, said we're a top paper. How about if we do a paper on screening pregnant women for depression? And they said, no way, we can't do that right now. Said, Why not? They said, because we've been really embarrassed. We published some trials that suggested it's dangerous for pregnant women to stop taking their antidepressants. We published some papers that said um, it's safe to take antidepressants uh, for the fetus. And um, there were con undisclosed conflicts of interest. So you would be doing a meta-analysis with conflicts of interest. Uh, I thought, wow, we've never thought about that. And so I said, well, what if we do a survey of uh, meta-analyses? Do they code for conflict of interest? And they said, well, make sure you include the New England Journal as well as JAMA. We don't want to be picked on right now. Uh -huh. And so I said, well, you know, JAMA doesn't. But uh, New England Journal doesn't publish these kind of studies, so it's not relevant. Well, just make it broader. So we did, and we published the paper. But one of our authors was from Cochrane Collaboration. So people started attacking us that we were biased in favor of Cochrane Collaboration because we said they did it better. So then we did a review in, of Cochrane Collaboration said no, there, were, there was a deficiency in the risk of bias. They didn't adequately take conflict of interest to account. We published in BMJ. We were contacted by the Cochrane Collaboration. We said we, we reluctantly agree with you and we're going to give you the Bill Silverman Award. I didn't know what that was. He's a certified troublemaker. In the early days of doing their systematic reviews, he was very annoying and forced them to do things differently. You've just forced us to do change our risk of bias uh, assessment to include um, investigator conflict of interest, and we're going to give you a thousand pounds, which we gave to the graduate student on the project. So, you know, um, now I'm pushing the issue, despite Ben Goldacre, that we have to be attentive to conflict of interest for non-pharmacological trials, and PACE is going to be an example. How about if we t take a break for a beer, and anybody who wants to keep going, we keep going, I'm around, and anybody who wants to escape, they're not, they don't feel held captive. I appreciate uh, holding your attention. Keep tweeting. Uh, I don't know what's going on in the community. 